It is the day before Thanksgiving, November 22nd in the year 2000. Suzette Kilo has just finished a long shift as a nurse at the hospital. Upon returning home, she finds a letter taped across her front door. We, the New London Development Corporation, would like to notify you that your home has been condemned. We must condemn your home using the power of eminent domain. A certificate of taking will be sent after notification of receiving this document has been sent by you. I just received the letter. They're going to condemn my home, too. I knew this day was coming. I, I guess I just didn't expect it to actually happen. We worked so hard to petition against this. I, I started a new life. I, I got a new job. This is my home. We have to fight this. How can they just take our homes? You know what? Let me call that, law, that DC lawyer that we found it. And we'll talk soon. Ms. Kilo meets public interest lawyer Scott Bullock of the Institute for Justice to discuss how to save her house from condemnation. I don't want to understand how this happened. I've tried so hard to prevent them from taking my home. <coughs> what can we do? You and your neighbors have made a valiant effort, Ms. Kilo. I, I sincerely believe you have the right to own your property. I don't believe the Development Corporation has the right to condemn your home using eminent domain. My neighborhood isn't, isn't blighted. I worked very hard to get here. I, I got a new job. I renovated my home. And the neighborhood is really better because of what we've done. <coughs> Here's the issue I see. The U.S. Constitution's Fifth Amendment taking clause states, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Consequently, the development corporation can't take your home for non-public use. Uh, wait, what do you mean? Public use is uh, a taking of land by the government to build something such as a road, a highway, a, a public work facility, a military base. But the taking in your case does not fit this description. Well, how can they just take my home and then claim that it's all right? Suzette... Imagine the following scene in Governor Rowland's office. Come on, boss, relax a little. I mean, the latest polling numbers indicate that the Democratic contenders are backing up from the challenge. If you ask me, we have this race. I understand that, Peter, but whether I'm leading in the polls or not, I'm still running the blue state. I want to do more than just win this election. I want to carry as many of the most Democratic cities as I can in the process. Well, no Connecticut town looks more Democratic than New London. You have Democrats currently outnumber Republicans more than four to one among registered voters. They dominate every election. Then we have to win New London. Boss, we've had this conversation before. Peter, I won't let you challenge me on this. New London's unemployment rate is twice as high as the statewide average. Industry and business have all but left. Crime is up. The people are hopeless, and this is our opportunity to win them over. You're still set on an economic revitalization project, aren't you? Yes, along the waterfronts. If we can pull off a successful urban renewal there, we can win the hearts of the voters. It'll be a hard undertaking, but we'll get it done if that's what you want. Let's talk more now about restarting the New London Development Corporation. I want to speak with Claire about heading it up. Well, I've already given her a call. She'll be here in just a few minutes. She wants to talk to you about Pfizer's intent to purchase the waterfront property for its new facility. Good, Peter. We want Claire on board with us. She's beautiful. She's persuasive. And she's president of Connecticut College. People will follow her lead. Ah, here she is now. Claire, it's so good to see you. Thanks for coming. It's good to see you again, Peter. It's a pleasure to meet you, Claire. You as well, Governor. Claire, let's get right to business. Peter tells me Pfizer is interested in buying the waterfront property? That's right. Pfizer wants to develop the property for a new research facility. But they're not yet prepared to purchase the land? Pfizer is concerned that not all the property owners with the new development area are willing to sell the land. Well, that's okay. We expect that. As a government entity, the New London Development Corporation will have the authority to take the properties through eminent domain. How is that? If we make the argument that the urban renewal spurred by Pfizer's facility will benefit the general public, we can successfully seize the properties of owners who refuse to sell their homes with it. We can talk more about this in my office. But Scott, that doesn't seem fair. 
The question here is really whether this seizure of private property, a taking, is really for public use as a Fifth Amendment requires. Well, is it? I don't think so. Suzette so Kilo and her neighbors sued the city of New London, arguing that the city's seizure of their houses was not for legitimate public use as stated by the Fifth Amendment's taking clause. The Supreme Court of Connecticut ruled against the property owners in a four to three decision, arguing that the taking did not violate state or federal law. Following the Supreme Court of Connecticut's decision, Kilo appealed to the United States Supreme Court. Oral arguments before the court were held on February 22nd, 2005 at 10, 12 a.m. We now hear arguments in the case Kilo versus City of New London. Mr. Horton will be representing the City of New London, and Mr. Bullock will be arguing on behalf of Suzette Kilo. Mr. Bullock, you may begin. Thank you, Justice O'Connor. May it please the court? This case is about whether there are any limits on the government's eminent domain power under the public use requirement of the Fifth Amendment. Every home, church, or corner store would produce more tax revenue and jobs if it were a Costco, a shopping mall, or a private office building. But if that's the justification for the use of eminent domain, then any city can take property anywhere within its borders for any private use that it make more money than what it is now. Mr. Bullock, you admitted the fact that the city of New London is in a very depressed state. This plan was implemented in order to create more jobs to revive the economy. The issue is that this law affects every city the same, whether there is a depressed economy or not. Every city in this country will benefit from more tax revenue, but the mere desire for more tax revenue cannot serve as the justification for the taking of property. Counselor, we addressed this issue in the Berman case. In that case, we sided with the Planning Commission. Large areas of Washington, D.C. were blighted. The owner of an unblighted department store filed suit and claimed that he should not have to sell his property. We ruled that he had to sell his store in order for the plan to take shape and have the best effect for the community. Notwithstanding Berman's narrow holding regarding blight, this court has recognized for over 200 years that there are limits on the eminent domain power that they cannot be used for private cases. And that has been con consistent strain throughout this court's history. There is no taking for private use that you can imagine in reality that wouldn't also have a public benefit of some kind. Whether it's increasing jobs or increasing taxes, that's a fact of the world. Your Honor, we think this cuts way too broadly. Why do you believe it to be too broad? By using that interpretation, every property, every private establishment, every home can then be taken for any private use. Not necessarily. The taking of property can only be justified in so much as there is a public use, which most of the time there is. Do you agree with that last statement? Well, again, the eminent domain power is broad, but there has to be limits. But you take the position that a city that is suffering from enormous lack of jobs and economic depression has no public use purpose for the taking of land to enable job creation? Well, that is correct, Your Honor. I see no issue with the government buying land from sellers and once establishing a large enough parcel, selling to a developer. This use of funds will generate more tax revenue in the long run, as well as help out those private business ventures by giving them land they otherwise wouldn't be able to collect. It will also help the local economy by providing more jobs. Do you believe this is a legitimate explanation of public use? I do not believe this is a legitimate explanation of public use. If I understand you correctly, you want us to make a distinction between blight and government economic revival. Is that correct? According to the eminent domain authority, yes, Your Honor, we believe that. Is that the distinction you want us to make? Yes, that is the line we want drawn. I suppose that is difficult to label something blighted because blight is a matter of perception. What might be blighted to one person might not be to another. That is precisely the issue we conceive in this case. The line is too subjective to order to be limited. Mr. Bullock, would you please reiterate what test you would like us to use for and adopt in this case? We would like this court to adopt a blight line rule. I understand. Isn't that, in effect, changing the test from public use to efficient public use? Are you suggesting that if I condemn land for a public utility and that public utility turns out to be very inefficient, that my condemnation is invalid? No, Your Honor. Do you want us to sit here and evaluate the prospects of each condemnation one by one? 
No, Your Honor, I'm simply advocating there should be some sort of reasonable certainty that the anticipated public benefit is to come about. I'm not talking about ongoing oversight. I'm talking about the certainty of public benefit. Mr. Bullock, how often do takings for um, economic development occur in this country? Quite frequently, Your Honor. The frequency of such takings is why we're having to trying to establish limits on the eminent domain power today. The current interpretation of this power does not protect private property owners. We believe that it is crucial to adopt strict guidelines. It is essential that this court incorporate some sort of minimum standards to ensure that the public use is actually met. But I would like to remain, reserve the remainder of my time. Very well. Mr. Horton. Justice O'Connor, and may it please the court, the main function of the takings clause is to provide just compensation. The redevelopment plan in question compensates the sellers and uplifts the economy of New London. Well, but it has to be for a valid public use. Yes, it does, Your Honor. Okay. Your Honor, there is no principal basis for the court to make what is really a value judgment about whether a long-term plan to revive an economically depressed city is of a public use higher or lower rank constitutionally. But what issue is it really if New London is in a depressed economic state? If the city believes it can do better but is not in a depressed state, then does this eminent domain power have validity? I believe so. But would you say that this power would be justified if property was taken from person A who pays less taxes and given to person B who pays more? For example, a Motel 6 in the city thinks that we could have a Ritz Carlton. That would bring in higher tax revenues. Now, um, would that be okay? Yes, Your Honor, that would be okay. I, uh, because <laughs> otherwise, you're in the position of drawing the line. I mean, there is- Let me get this straight. You believe it all right to take A and give to B simply to collect more tax revenue? Yes, Your Honor. There are statements in our cases that say you cannot take from A just to give to B. Do you agree that there is substance to that proposition and that that proposition is correct? Yes, Your Honor, I do. It was a binding fact of the trial court that this development is primarily for the citizens of New London, not for Pfizer or the private developer. Yes, Your Honor, I agree with that. And that is why you don't need to determine whether you go beyond economic depression of a city in this particular case. Where there is purely economic development in mind, is there any reasonable objection as to why a line should not be drawn with regard to the public use purpose? Why do they not just buy the property on the open market then? The particular issue in this case is that there are several people who refuse to sell their parcel of land. So what is the land on which Ms. Kilo and the others reside going to be used for? Their properties are within parcels 3 and 4A. What is to be used for parcels 3 and 4A? Office space and an Amtrak line are planned to support the rest of the Pfizer complex. And 4A is going to be a park and a marina for the community. Mr. Horton, I'm aware that your clients are paying for the property, but you are attempting to purchase land from sellers who do not wish to sell. Does their refusal to sell count for nothing? Of course not. But if this project really is as great as you and your clients are claiming, then why are these public condemnations necessary? The reason for these condemnations is that there are plaintiffs in this case that will not sell at any price. I would also like to add that the property that the city is buying will not be sold to the developer, it will be leased. I find it odd that 100% of the premiums for this new development go to the developer and to the taxpayer and not to the property owner. It seems to me that you're just going to have to assume that in this case there's going to be just compensation. Well, put yourself in the position of one of the homeowners. If you bought a house for $50,000 and it is now worth $500,000, then you have $450,000 of profit. Now, after you sell your house, you must pay 30% taxes. That leaves around $350,000 for relocation costs, which will not even get you a house like the one you had. Is there some way of assuring that just compensation actually puts a person in the position you'd be in if he did not have to sell his house? Or is he inevitably worse off? Well, I mean, Mr. first of all. Well, Father <coughs> Justice Breyer, I guess Father Stanford. <coughs> that is, is there a problem of making the homeowner or the property holder? But I suppose the answer to that goes to the measure of compensation, which is not the issue here. Yes, and that's as I said earlier. What this lady wants is not more money. No amount of money is going to satisfy her. She has been living in this house, and she's living here for the rest of her life. She does not want to move. 
She said, I'll move if it's being taken for a public use, but by God, you're giving it to some other private individual because that private individual is going to pay more taxes. Now that seems to me to be an objection in principle and an objection in principle to which the public use requirement of the Constitution seems to be addressed. The issue here is that you can take property and you can give it to a private entity, to a railroad, or to some public utility. Now the railroad and the public utility, they do serve a public purpose. But when you take the property and you give it to a private entity, simply because that entity is going to hire more people and pay more taxes, then the distinction between public and private just washes out. Well, I don't agree, Your Honor, because I think, you know, I think if a person without a job and they're not able to get basic services from the town because that town can't afford it, that is just as important as a train running on time or eliminating flight. Mr. Bullock, you have your remaining time to make your final comments. I think the key to understanding their argument is the answer to this question. Can you take a Motel 6 and give it to a fancier hotel? The defense's answer is yes, and that's really what's at stake here. This abuse of eminent domain power has been used all over the country. Whether it's to take a dollar store to convert it to a Costco or parcels of land for a redevelopment plan, the issue is the same. In the end, the property owners are the ones that are being abused, even if the plan is a successful one. Poor individuals are the people that are hurt by this sort of abuse. This eminent domain power puts the non-blighted poor and the working class neighborhoods at risk because of their lack of tax revenue. That is why there are so many organizations and so many individuals who support the property owners in this case. The common person is at risk. If there are no further questions, Your Honors, I'll close. Thank you. The case is submitted. said that it is emphatically the province and the duty of the Judicial Department to say what the law is. 214 years after the Bill of Rights was ratified on December 15, 1791, and 216 years after U.S. Representative James Madison proposed what became the Fifth Amendment on June 8, 1789, the nine justices now must decide what the Takings Clause Public Use Subclause means for Suzette Keela. Did I hear my name? Oh, well, good morning, Mr. President. Good morning. Did I hear something about the takings clause? Why, yes, it's 2005, and the U.S. Supreme Court is deciding how to apply those words which you proposed over two centuries ago. As you know from reading the Federalist Papers, which my friends John Jay, Alex Hamilton, and I wrote under the pseudonym Publius, we are very concerned about the power of factions to take control of the new federal government. We fear the flames of measures favoring things such as a rage for paper money, for an abolition of debts, for an equal division of property, or for any other improper or wicked project, which I wrote about in Federalist Number 10. We designed the Constitution system of checks and balances in which power checks power in the federal government, with its three branches legislative, executive, and judicial, along with the extended republic of local, state, and federal government to prevent the spread of such a conflagration across the Union. Mr. President, although the original Philadelphia Constitution did not, did not contain a Bill of Rights, a few states, including your native Virginia, thought it was important to amend the Constitution to include a list of rights that would augment the Constitution's structural protections of liberty. I have long believed, along with my heroes John Locke and William Blackstone, that a government is instituted to protect property of every sort, and that alone is a just government which impartially secures to every man whatever is his own. You know, during the ratification debates, many citizens were concerned about the despotic power of eminent domain practiced by King George III, in which the royal governments seized private property for the tyrannical king's own purposes. I thought it was important to include protections for takings of private property for public uses in the Bill of Rights. 
I placed it next to the criminal justice protections, such as the prohibition against self-incrimination and double jeopardy, to emphasize the close association of property rights with personal liberty. Americans needed protection against both arbitrary prosecutions and deprivations. I actually lifted language from the Northwest Ordinance and the Massachusetts and Vermont's Constitutions for the Takings Clause. You probably did not know this, but the U.S. Supreme Court actually unanimously extended the Fifth Amendment's taking clauses protections of private property to apply to state governments via the 14th Amendment's due process clause in the case of Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad Company versus Chicago in 1897. That is good to hear. Oh, I see that the justices are just returning now. It seems like they are just about to issue their ruling. determine whether a city's decision to take property for the purpose of economic development satisfies the public use requirement of the Fifth Amendment. This is not a case where the city is opening condemned land to the public, at least not directly. The land will be used as a part of a carefully considered development plan. Trial judges in Connecticut agreed that there was no illegitimate purpose in this case. The city's development was not created to benefit a specific class of citizens. This court long ago rejected any literal requirements that condemned property be put into use for the general public. At the end of the 19th century, when this court started to apply the Fifth Amendment to the state, it embraced a broader interpretation of the public use and applied it as a public purpose policy. Not only was the use by the public test difficult to administer, it proved to be impractical given the diverse and always evolving needs of society. The disposition of this case therefore turns on the question of whether the city's development plan serves a public purpose. Without exception, our cases have defined that concept broadly reflecting our long-standing policy of deference to legislative judgments in this field. Those who govern the city that decided the Fort Trumbull area was distressed enough to require economic recovery are entitled to our deference. The city has formed a plan that will create benefits for the community economically. The city is planning to form a whole greater than the sum of all of its parts. The city invoked a state statute that specifically authorizes the use of eminent domain. Just as we declined to second guess the city's considered judgments about the efficacy of its development plan, we also declined to second guess the city's determinations as to what lands it needs to acquire in order to effectuate the project. Once the question of the public purpose has been decided, the amount and character of land to be taken for the project and the need for a particular track to complete the integrated plan rests in the discretion of the legislative branch. The city's plan has justly satisfied the public use part of the takings clause in the Fifth Amendment. We do not minimize the hardships that the condemnations may entail, notwithstanding the payment of just compensation. The judgment of the Supreme Court of Connecticut is affirmed. Justice Kennedy. I join the opinion for the court, and I add more observations. The court has ruled that the taking should be upheld by the public use clause. This use needs to be rationally related to a conceivable public purpose. A court should strike down any taking as intended to benefit a specific private party with only incidental public benefits. A court confronted with a plausible accusation of impermissible favoritism to private parties 
should treat the objection as a serious one and review the record to see if it has merit. Though, with the presumption that the government's actions were reasonable and intended to serve a public purpose. Here, the trial court conducted a careful and extensive inquiry into whether, in fact, the development plan is of primary benefit to the developer and private businesses which may eventually locate in the plan area. As the trial court concluded, and as this court holds, benefiting Pfizer was not the primary motivation for this development plan. Rather, the primary motivation was for the citizens of New London to take advantage of Pfizer's presence. The development plan was intended to revitalize the local economy, not to serve the interests of any private party. This case, then, survives the meaningful review that is required under the Public Use Clause. Justice O'Connor. The Fifth Amendment was built upon two conditions to exercise eminent domain. The Takings Clause, in its very nature, assumes the government can take private property without consent of the owner. However, the taking of private property must be for public use, and the owners must be justly compensated. To reason, as the court does, that the incidental public benefits resulting from the subsequent ordinary use of private property render economic development takings for public use is to wash out any distinction between private and public use of property and thereby effectively to delete the words for public use from, from the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment. Accordingly, I respectfully dissent. As described by Alexander Hamilton, one of the goals of government is to protect private property. Together, ensure stable property ownership by providing safeguards against excessive, unpredictable, or unfair use of the government's eminent domain power, particularly against those owners who, for whatever reasons, may be unable to protect themselves in the political process against that majority's will. Where is the line between public and private property use? In many cases, eminent domain has been used effectively. The government lies within its constitutional right to transfer property for roads, hospitals, a military base, or property that is made available to the public, such as stadiums and public utility buildings. The real question is, are economic development takings considered constitutional? I believe that they are not. The court has expanded the meaning of public use. It holds that sovereign property may take private property currently put to ordinary private use and give it over for new, ordinary private use, so long as the new use is predicted to generate some secondary benefit to the public, such as increased tax revenue, more jobs, and maybe even aesthetic pleasure. But nearly any lawful use of real private property can be said to generate some incidental benefit to the public. Today, nearly all real private property is susceptible to condemnation on the court's theory. Any property may now be taken for the benefit of another private party, but the fallout from this decision will not be random. The beneficiaries are likely to be those citizens with disproportionate influence and power in the political process, including large corporations and development firms. As for the victims, the government now has the license to transfer property from those with fewer resources to those with more. And Justice Thomas. The framers of the Constitution did not envision that the public use principle would be used so loosely. The Constitution allows for public use and not public necessity. The court's attempt to redefine the term public has defied the very framework built by the founders. The court has replaced the public use principle with public purpose as long as the purpose is legitimate and the means not irrational. This shift enables the court to hold against all common sense that a costly urban renewal project whose stated purpose is a vague promise of new jobs and increased tax revenue, but which is also suspiciously agreeable to the Pfizer Corporation, is for a public use. I cannot agree. If economic development takings are the basis for the term public use, then the court has erased the public use clause from our Constitution. I do not believe that this court can eliminate the liberties expressly enumerated in the Constitution. In my view, the public use clause was put into place to specifically limit the government's ability to take private property. The urban renewal project provides monetary compensation, but no compensation is just enough to uproot families from their homes. The allowance of government to take private property for public use 
is bad enough. We have now extended it to encompass a vague public purpose that can include any economically beneficial goal as defined by the legislature. There is no justifi justification for affording almost insurmountable deference to legislative conclusions that a use serves a public use. Even under the public purpose interpretation, it is most implausible that the framers intended to defer to legislatures as to what satisfies the public use clause, uniquely among all the express provisions of the Bill of Rights. The losses suffered as a result of this deference will fall especially on poor communities. It encourages those citizens with disproportionate influence and political power, including large corporations and development firms, to victimize the weak. Urban renewal projects have been associated with the displacements of blacks, and regrettably, the consequences of the court's decision will aggravate these effects. When faced with a clash of constitutional principles and a line of unreasoned cases wholly divorced from the text, history, and structure of our founding documents, we should not hesitate to resolve the tension in favor of the Constitution's original meaning. Following the Supreme Court's Kelo decision, every plaintiff from the eminent, eminent domain lawsuit left New London and never returned. Every home in the 90-acre redevelopment area was demolished, yet even to date, no revitalization project has been started. In 2008, the LDC announced that its developer had failed to secure the funding required for the building project. Pfizer, whose new, intent, whose new facility was meant to uplift the New London area, never built on the Fort Trumbull property, but chose to retain its facility on the other side of the Thames River. As a result, the Fort Trumbull area is a wasteland to this day. Covering weeds, litter, debris, and rubble, the redevelopment area is now more blighted than any supporter of the Kilo Takens could have ever imagined. It is interesting to note that the city of New London has since issued a formal apology for the taking of the Kilo House. The Kilo case, like many controversial cases, continues to elicit a response across the United States. The case has since sparked outrage among conservatives and liberals, Republicans and Democrats, all expressing displeasure with the decision. Several states have passed constitutional amendments to their state constitutions, banning the taking of private property for economic development. Other states have passed legislation to protect property owners from abusive eminent domain practices. At times, Supreme Court cases have way of starting debates that would not otherwise occur. Had Suzette Kilo not brought her case before the Supreme Court, the American public might still be unaware of the terrible abuses perpetrated in the name of eminent domain. Now, however, they have a chance to fight back. The lesson here is that the Constitution cannot uphold itself. Rather, it requires the constant attention and devotion of all American citizens to ensure that its principles and protections remain in effect. It is often said that upon leaving the Constitutional Convention, Benjamin Franklin was approached by a group of citizens, asking what form of government the Convention had created. His response, a republic, if you can keep it. As our founders believe, the success of the republic depends upon the involvement of its citizens. Our country is in need of your participation. Without it, rights such as those to property will continue to be lost. It is only your involvement that will ensure that a government of, of the, the people, people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth.